Hi and welcome back to another video of Medic Notes. This video is on vertigo and its different causes. For introduction, vertigo is a specific symptom of hallucination of movement, or spinning of the environment, often resulting in issues with balance. Whilst etiology varies, all causes of vertigo produce a conflict between the vestibular input and other sensory inputs of balance, such as proprioception and vision, resulting in the sensation of vertigo. The causes of which can be divided into central or otological. Central causes of vertigo include multiple sclerosis, posterior stroke, migraine, or intracranial space occupying lesion. Otological causes of vertigo include benign positional paroxysmal vertigo, Meniere's disease, and vestibular neuronitis. In this video I will focus more on the otological causes. Balance disorders can be multifactorial and have a wide range of causes outside of disorders of the vestibular system or brain. It is important to consider alternative medical issues, such as circulatory or cardiac disease, and metabolic issues. Indeed, in the acute setting, the most critical diagnosis to exclude is a posterior circulation stroke. First, benign positional paroxysmal vertigo, is caused by the presence of canaliths in the semicircular canal instead of the utricle. Once in the canal, movement of the patient's head will result movement of these crystals that cause an abnormal movement of endolymph, resulting in vertigo. Risk factors for BPPV include head injury, previous history of labyrinthitis, and older patients. That said, in most patients it is unprovoked. In BPPV, vertigo attacks last seconds, and result from the same head movement, causing the onset of symptoms every time. Accompanying symptoms typically include nausea or vomiting. A classical history is of vertigo when turning the head, for example, movement of the head on the pillow in the morning. This picture shows the formation of crystals and their migration into the semicircular canals in BPPV. The diagnostic examination for BPPV is the dix Hallpike maneuver, with a positive test invoking the symptoms and nystagmus will be present. The nystagmus will typically fatigue in less than a minute. Once the condition is diagnosed, specific maneuvers can be employed to remove the crystals from the canal and resolve the symptoms. A common maneuver is Epley's maneuver, performed if the canalith are in the posterior canal. Patients post Epley's maneuver are advised not to drive, to keep sleep upright, not to bend down or look upwards for 48 hours. Resolution is not always complete, with some patients requiring repeated Epley's as symptoms persist, and BPPV can also recur. Patients can also be advised to perform Brandt Darrow exercises, positions they can practice at home that are beneficial in reducing symptom intensity. Most commonly, crystals form in the posterior canal, resulting in a rotatory nystagmus to be present if in the horizontal canal then result in a horizontal nystagmus. Second, for many years disease, it is a disorder comprised with a triad of symptoms including vertigo, hearing loss, and tinnitus. Current theories in its pathophysiology suggest the symptoms result from an increase in endolymphatic pressure. Caused by dysfunctioning sodium channels, an osmotic gradient is subsequently set up that draws fluid into the endolymph, increasing the endolymphatic pressure to cause symptoms. Many airs disease presents with attacks comprised of a triad of severe paroxysmal vertigo, sensory neural hearing loss, and tinnitus. Symptoms are predominantly unilateral, lasting for minutes to hours, and usually resolve within 24 hours. During remission between attacks, the symptoms will improve yet repeated attacks result in a sensory neural hearing loss that worsens over time. Whilst the disease will burn out eventually with time, permanent sensory neural hearing loss can remain. Otoscopy will show a normal eardrum, audiometry will show a low-frequency sensory neural hearing loss, and tympanometry will show typonormal. In acute attacks, the vertigo and nausea symptoms can be reduced by a short course of prochlorperazine, which is a vestibular sedative, given either buccal or intramuscular. Some conservative measures have been suggested to aim to reduce attack frequency such as lifestyle advice, reducing salt or avoiding chocolate and caffeine, and regular beta-histine medication. If attacks persist despite prophylaxis, surgical intervention may be warranted. This can include intratympanic gentamicin injections, intratympanic steroid injections, endolymphatic sac destruction, or labyrinthectomy, which is now rarely performed. Lastly, vestibular neuronitis. This is inflammation of the vestibular nerve, resulting in vertigo that typically lasts days but can last weeks to months. Most cases are due to a viral infection with an upper respiratory tract infection preceding its onset in half of cases. Symptoms will be sudden onset and severely incapacitating, nearly always associated with nausea and vomiting. On otoscopy, the eardrum will be normal and a horizontal nystagmus will be present when examining the eyes. 
Neurological examination will be unremarkable and the hearing for these patients will be normal. Whilst most cases resolve fully within a week, long-term vestibular deficit after the acute episode can lead to unsteadiness over a period of weeks whilst the brain compensates for this. In an acute presentation of dizziness, assessment of a central neurological cause is essential, especially for posterior circulation stroke. Initially this typically involves CT head imaging and, if any uncertainty persists, a subsequent MRI head scan. Once diagnosed, however, most patients can be managed at home. During the acute episode, a patient may require vestibular sedatives, also considering intravenous fluids if the patient becomes dehydrated from vomiting. If there are persistent problems due to vestibular hypofunction, then the patient may require longer-term vestibular rehabilitation via Cothern-Cooksey exercises. That's all for this video, thank you.